Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I want to wish each of you a very blessed, happy Sabbath. I'm honored and privileged to have the privilege of being here with my wife this morning to worship with you. We bring you greetings from the General Conference, from your worldwide family. We are a group of individuals who probably are about 35 to 40 million people have gathered together on, your sa on this Holy Sabbath day around the world. Now, official church membership is about 21 million, but when you count all of the friends, family, visitors, young people who gather on a Sabbath morning, I'm glad that we can be part of that great family. And I just want to thank you for the privilege of coming here this morning. Uh, I have heard of Glendale from probably the earliest days of my childhood with the voice of prophecy. I am from Western Canada, my wife and I are from Canada, and uh, I am a product of Seventh-day Adventist education, went to a little church school which had a high attendance of about 12, average of attendance of about six or seven, and almost all of them were my cousins. <laughs> and so, and uh, there was a number of years when I was the only boy in the school, so you can tell uh, a little bit of my background, but during those years, we always be hearing about the Voice of Prophecy in Glendale, California. And I am so glad for the influence of Voice of Prophecy and of this uh, location, this hospital, the school. Congratulations, graduates, uh, to come down and get those bouquets and those flowers. Even up there on the very, very back row, I see a number of those uh, beautiful garlands. And uh, congratulations for this milestone in your academic uh, achievement. This is wonderful. So uh, I want to just uh, praise God and thank him for the privilege of uh, being able to be with you this morning. I also want to thank this congregation in a very strong way, in a very special way for your significant support of your World Church family through the years, and particularly for Hope Channel. It's been my wife and my privilege to lead in Hope Channel for about 23, 24 years. Candace, please come up. I want you to share a little report this morning. Uh, although we are not officially, uh, technically, leaders, directors of Hope Channel, uh, I always tell people, I, Hope Channel is not in my heart, it's in my DNA. And uh, so uh, it's uh, something that's very close to us. And today, Candace, uh, tell us how many channels are there in the Hope Channel Network? We have nearly 50 channels globally. And, and why such a number of channels? Because the gospel needs to be contextualized in many, many different cultures and languages. And so we praise God for what he's done with our church family and, and the ministry of, of Hope Channel. Now, all of those different channels have uh, a co a contextualized uh, messaging and programming. But I, one of the services of Hope Channel is the satellite evangelism that is conducted in different cultures, different languages. Tell us very quickly a report of what's happened in Tanzania, which is the most recent yes. satellite evangelism event. Well, last Sabbath, um, Hope Channel Tanzania, which is one of six channels that we have on the continent of Africa, concluded a satellite net evangelism event with Pastor Mark Finley. And as of last Sabbath, they had baptized across the country of Tanzania 16,187 people who attended in 4,500 locations to listen live to Pastor Finley coming from Mwanza and the stadium there. And last Sabbath, Brad, they say the audience in the stadium was somewhere between 40 and 60,000. So I'm not sure how they did their counting, but we've been there and that is a big stadium. And we are thrilled with what's happening. At the end of this month in the country of Kenya, Pastor Jeffrey Mbwana will conduct another satellite net evangelism program in Kenya and for three weeks, and we expect a big, uh, wonderful support for that. And God is doing something really special in your global church through the ministry of Hope Channel, and we praise him for that. I want to thank uh, this congregation, particularly Sister Barros, Orphan Barros, thank you so much for each of you for the support that you give. You know, we need all of the media that are heavily involved in this church. We need the television. We need 
uh, radio, Adventist World Radio. We need websites. We need social media evangelism. And uh, we need print media. Uh, I serve uh, in the church, as has been introduced, and just a few weeks ago, the brethren asked me to take the leadership of the Review and Herald Publishing Association, which is the oldest institution of the church. So I'm going from video digital media to hopefully digital print media. <laughs> and uh, we invite your prayers in, in that way. I'm uh, delighted this morning. I understand that uh, the service is being uh, simulcast uh, on the internet, being uh, carried live. And so for those of you who are watching, we want to welcome in a special way what uh, is taking place. And I don't know, but there might be somebody here this morning who is not an official member of the Seventh Adventist Church. I want to welcome you in a very special way. We uh, have a very open communion. We believe in sharing Jesus Christ as widely as possible. So uh, we're just grateful that you're able to be here this morning, and we thank you for that. Before we go to the God's Word, please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, our hearts are thrilled this morning as we have the privilege of knowing that you are our loving, ideal, heavenly Father. And dear God, this morning we lift our hearts to you, just asking that you would please uh, come in and speak to us and bring the message deeply home to our hearts. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are two very important chapters in the Bible that focus in on the return of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to please take your Bibles and turn with me to those chapters. Matthew chapter 24 usually connotes in our minds the idea of the signs of Jesus' soon return. And we tend to look at all of these signs in a special way, and uh, sometimes some of us uh, get in the habit of saying, Oh, 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 did you, did you see what happened this week or this month that indicates the nearness of Jesus' coming? And friends, there's no question that those applications of Bible prophecy are valid because we don't know the day or the time of the hour of Jesus second coming but Jesus has given us those signs that we can always be ready now this morning I'm not going to be speaking about the signs of the times those are found in verses uh, 1 through to verse uh, uh, 44 in Matthew chapter 24 I want to focus in on how Jesus applied the significance of the signs of the times to the end time believers and followers of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 44, through to the end of chapter 25, Jesus tells four stories. And what he is doing in those four stories is describing how his people, his followers, should be living at the end of time. Because to be a follower of Jesus Christ is far more than just having your name on a church roll or claiming that you happen to be a Christian by perhaps wearing a cross on, a, on something around your neck. Jesus is calling for his individuals, his followers, to be authentic, to be authentic in their following of him by the way they live. They have a dynamic living relationship with him. And so what does he do? He paints four verbal pictures. Four pictures of what his people will be like at the end of time. And it's a composite, composite description. I was thrilled this morning to see the large number of young people, children coming forward for the children's story. Now I know that they've gone to children's church. Uh, but some of you who are a little bit older children, uh, maybe 81, 2, 3, or 91, 2, or 3, might want to take some notes. You might want to draw a picture if you do. We're looking at four pictures of Jesus Christ, and we're looking here at verses 45 through to verse uh, 40, uh, 51 as the first picture. What I wish to invite you to do this morning is to follow with me these pictures. And I invite you to look at them in the light of what is Jesus saying about my life today and how it applies to me. You know, we have this expression, if the shoe fits, what do you do? Wear it. 
So there is a personal application to this. There's also a corporate application to this. The church, this congregation, the churches in California, the churches globally need to be following the mandate that Jesus spells out in these four parables, these four verbal pictures. And just like we have the uh, proverb that says a picture is worth a thousand words, we have this picture of these four pictures where Jesus is communicating a spiritual experience that he invites every one of us to follow. And young people, particularly those of you who are graduates, I want to encourage you to thoughtfully, prayerfully implement this in your personal life. The first parable <clears throat> is the, that of the faithful servant and the evil servant. In this parable, Jesus tells about a, uh, a wealthy man who leaves on his journey and he leaves to his servants uh, and gives to them uh, their responsibilities. And please notice here, verse 45, then the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Here is the wise servant. And then notice in verse 48, that evil servant. It's important, friends, to notice in this all four of these parables that Jesus is not contrasting the world, unbelievers, with believers. He's contrasting believers, false believers, and authentic believers. This is a picture that applies to our hearts and lives. It's the good servant and the evil servant. Now, that's true all the way through. We'll note that further as we get into the other parables, because I want us to catch the big picture here. And that has an important application for us today. Jesus here is inviting us to a relationship with, Jesus, with him that transcends nominal, formal religiosity. False religion focuses in on behavior-based acceptance with God. And Jesus is saying, no, it goes far beyond that. It is to possess our hearts and lives and transform us in every way. And so he is contrasting the true and the false. There's also another very powerful lesson in this, I believe. Sometimes in our world today, even within the Christian church, and dare I say it, even within the Adventist church, we find some people who are wringing their hands and uh, complaining and criticizing and condemning because they say, oh, look at the apostasy of the church. Look how bad people are. Look what these trends are, blah, 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 blah. My friends, let's not be surprised. 2,000 years ago, Jesus looked down at the end of time and says, my church is going to be composed of both the true and the false. And so, my friend, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged when somebody comes along with a negative message. No, my friend, look at it and say, hey, that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus predicted that. And by God's grace, every one of us can be on the right side on that relationship of authentic, genuine discipleship with Jesus. And here the true disciple is giving food in due season. What is the food that the disciples are, are to what, are the, what is the food that you and I are supposed to, uh, to follow and to give? This true servant gives the food in due season. The food that Jesus is speaking about is the Bible. It's the message of the Bible. It's the message that applies for today. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He says, the words that I, the, in Jeremiah, I heard your words and I did eat them. What did he mean? Did he take you chew on the pages of the Bible? No. It talks about a spiritual relationship where we study, we know, we apply it in our hearts and lives. And friends, the true disciple, the true follower of God is the one who is sharing the word, giving the word. 
it is another way of describing the experience of evangelism. It's the other, it's another way of describing the experience of witnessing. The church is mandated by Jesus Christ. Go you therefore and teach all nations. And this is the word of God that we are to take to the world church. You know, friends, Jesus is inviting you and me to be faithful witnesses for him. He calls us to go and to share. Go to the person next door. Go to your work colleagues. Go to your community. Go to the nations. Go, teach, share. The word of God is life-giving, and Jesus invites us to do that. And this is why, as a world church, we have this program called TMI. Now, that's not too much information. <laughs> <laughs> okay, unfortunately the acronym is the same, but the idea is total member involvement and around the world God is blessing in a remarkable way uh, to, uh, to use the church to share the message of Jesus Christ. This year we're focusing on the country of Japan in a special way, but what you heard about Tanzania and you hear about other nations, other areas of the world, TMI membership involvement I hope and pray that you are part of total member involvement. Now, let's just look at that a little bit further. As a church, as the Glendale Church, as the Vallejo Drive Church, we are called to make the proclamation of the Bible, the message of Jesus Christ, the number one task. And church leaders, I don't know who you are. I want to encourage you to focus on evangelism in all its many different ways. That's the purpose, the meaning, the, the direction that the church is to follow. But let's notice now, it says here, this, the false servant, my, the false servant says in verse 48, the evil servant, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunken. Now, I would like to just uh, look at this a little bit further. And I'm... Use the one on the pulpit? Okay. How's this one? Okay. Okay. This is working. Just, just follow with me the whole idea. The, the false servant says, my master delays his coming. He doesn't say, my master is not coming. He says, my master is delaying his coming. And the attitude is, you know, the apostle Paul talked about the second coming of Jesus Christ. All of the Valdensians, the reformers, they all believed that Jesus was coming. William Miller, that Baptist preacher who 19 years before the Adventist church was formed, man, he led that Advent awakening. That's 160, 70, 80 years ago. Man, I, I live in nanoseconds. I live by this thing, my appointment book and all those things right away. And Jesus is coming, how did you say? Soon? What's your definition of soon? Yeah, yeah I believe he's coming. But let's not get too excited about it. Yeah, when he comes, he comes. My, what, what, is the, what does the evil servant say in his heart, friend? What does he say? My Lord is delaying his coming. My friends, we are to live in the immediacy, the imminency of Jesus' second coming. And yes, it is true. Jesus could come at any time. There's no question about that. If God chose to, he could come to this world. And friends, let's face it, another fact. We are all only one heartbeat away from the second coming. We're one heartbeat away. Uh, one of our home churches back in Western Canada is the uh, Kelowna Church area. Some of you know that particular region. A few weeks back, they were starting an evangelistic series, uh, a large citywide series with six, seven churches participating. And the head elder of the Orchard City Church was out on a Tuesday afternoon with the Bible instructor distributing handbills, inviting people door to door to come to the meetings. She was on one side of the street, he was on the other side of the street. He was a very close personal friend of mine and our family, our kids grew up together. 
Walking up to the door of a house, he suddenly keeled over and died. Massive heart attack. How many of us know of people who suddenly pass? What, what will happen to my, my friend? What will happen to, to Brother Quarry? My friend, the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes again, what's going to happen to the righteous dead? What? What will happen? He's going to be raised to life. And when he comes out of that tomb, out of that grave, the first thing he will see is Jesus Christ and his coming. The last thing he saw was as he collapsed on that, on that doorstep. And the next thing he sees is what? Jesus' second coming. We're all only one heartbeat away from the return of Jesus Christ. My friends, and what does the, ma what does the false servant say? It says, my Lord delays his coming, number one. Number two, he begins to beat his fellow servants. And number three, begins to eat and to drink with the drunkards. Let's paraphrase that. He begins to beat his fellow servants. It's his fellow servants. It's not the non-Christians. It's not the non-members. It's his fellow servants. In other words, put it in plain, simple language, this person doesn't know to get, how to get along in the church. Now, I don't know about this congregation, please. I'm not talking out of, out of school. <laughs> but friends, in every congregation that I have the privilege of ministering to, there is sometimes some people who are going different directions. God calls for unity, my friends, not disunity. Yes, we have our own variety of opinions. Yes, we might have our different opinions about women's ordination or some other issue that happens in the church. But my friends, God calls for us to unite. The world church focuses on evangelism, and that's what we're to focus on. Yes, we might have our respective opinions, but my friends, let's remember that God calls us to unify. I encourage you to do that, my brothers and sisters. And then it says he begins to eat and drink with the drunkards. He gives up the Christian lifestyle. Jesus says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. What you look at on the internet, what you listen to on your podcast, music or otherwise, my young friends, I, I encourage you, Jesus Christ calls for us to honor him in our total lifestyle. We are to be authentic in every way. And I encourage you to keep that grid of what we should listen to and watch and all those things clearly in our minds and let's keep our minds focused on Jesus Christ. Number one, the true servant focuses on, on sh in on sharing Jesus Christ, on sharing the Word of God, the Bible. Let's go on. I've got to move quickly here. I realize the time is slipping away here. It says now the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. We heard a little bit about it with the children this morning. What's the story? There's a wedding. In the Middle East, it took about a week for a wedding to, took play, to take place. They celebrated for days. And here is an occasion where part of the fun of the wedding was that the bridal party and the groom's party would be different, separated, and the groom would try to surprise the bridal party, surprise the bride by catching them. And in that a day and age, when you didn't have electric lights, everybody brought along a little light, a little, little tiny basin of oil, and a little wick with one candle. You put one candle in a dark room with no electrical light, boy, that candle looks pretty bright. You put 50 or 60 or 100 of them in one room, you not only warm the room up, you've got a lot of light. And that's what they were doing. And so these girls were waiting. And Jesus says they were waiting and they were caught unprepared. They were all asleep. Notice it says they were all asleep. And uh, then in, notice that was in verse 5. The bridegroom was delayed and all slumbered and slept. My friends, Jesus said his church at the end of time would be asleep. You know, it's very easy in our society to get conditioned for non-response. We're bombarded with scores of messages. Increasingly, I watch three or four different news feeds on my cell phone, monitor them. And man, after a while, there's so many things that are happening that are non-Christian, you begin to say, oh yeah, well, it's just normal to see another volcano normal to have another shooting or whatever the case may be. It isn't, but you know, you're tempted to think that. My friends, 
they all slumbered and slept. And Jesus here pictures it that they didn't have the oil in their lamp. What's the oil in the Bible? What's the oil? It's the Holy Spirit. By their experience with Jesus Christ, by knowing his word, by following his word, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. But these people are, the false ones I'm speaking about, are the ones who don't have an authentic, genuine spiritual experience. And they're not ready. May I ask you a personal question? How is your personal spiritual walk with Jesus? Do you take time to study and to pray? I don't mean just like that. I mean, do you take time to reflect for the word of God to be the food of your heart and life? You see, Jesus here is saying, it's not enough just to be a, quotes, a church member. He's saying, have a personal relationship with me. Pray for the Holy Spirit. Ask Jesus to guide and direct you every minute of the day that you could be an authentic, genuine follower of his. How is your personal spiritual walk with God? Church leaders, may I ask you a question? What's the priority in spiritual leadership in the church as elders, as Sabbath school superintendents, as Sabbath school teachers? I, I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, the Sabbath school quarterly might appear to be something that's a bit out of date. It isn't. It's very current. You study that after a few years, you'll have an extremely comprehensive understanding of the Bible. And I want to encourage you to come to Sabbath school. It's a time to learn and study. That's a vital part of our spiritual experience. But it's more than Sabbath school. It's daily study of the Bible. I, uh, you know, the General Conference has this endorsed, this concept called revival and reformation. I'm very grateful for Pastor Wilson encouraging that. And if you go to the revival reformation sites, which are very easy to find, you'll find um, the, uh, the reading, a, cha rec a, a recommended chapter for the day, reading through the entire Bible. Today was 1 Corinthians chapter 2, a little email that comes and prompts you and encourages you to read the book, the chapter of the day. I encourage you to sign up for that. Get the prompt. What, why do we encourage revival and reformation? What's the reason for it? Just to have a program? No, my friend. The reason for it is to encourage us in our own personal spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. I hope that you do that. Number three, moving on very quickly here to uh, Matthew chapter 25, we find the parable of the three business managers. This wealthy man leaves on his, ta on his journey and he leaves a large sum of money to one of his business managers. He gives a half a million dollars to another $200,000 and to one $100,000 and he says, now take care of it, use it, manage it in the appropriate way. We have to move quickly. We find here in verses 24 through to verse uh, 29, the story, the, wise, the wealthy man goes away, gives his assets for management to these business managers, and then he comes back and says, okay, what did you do? You, 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 the guy who had $500,000, what did you do? And he says, oh, I earned $500,000 more. Wow, that's a pretty good return on investment, don't you think? ROI of 100%. And then he had 200,000 and he earns 200,000 more. Oh, wow, very good. He gets the same reward as the man who did five and five. And then there's the guy who has the one. And uh, this man says, I know you were a hard man. I knew you were a hard man and I was afraid. I was filled with fear. So what did I do? I dug a hole and buried the $100,000, and here it is, God. I give it back to you. It's all yours. <laughs> What's Jesus trying to describe? The two who are, who, who are blessed and who are, receive the commendation of the master, there's several lessons here. Number one, the reward is equal for those who are using their talents. The reward is equal. 
Those who earn five, five more, same reward. And then it teaches us that our talents can be developed. The talents, according to the Bible, are the natural gifts that we have, and they're also the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to us. Both categories or gifts are given to us, and Jesus expects us to use our talents and our abilities to the maximum. And as we do that, we will grow, whether it's it to be a pastor, a teacher, or whether to be a medical person, or a specialist, or whatever the case, my friend. If we will use our talents and our abilities, they will grow and develop. And Jesus says his authentic, genuine disciples at the end of time are people who are maximizing the assets that they receive and they are developing those and they're using those talents for the advancement of God's work. Young people who just graduated, don't sell yourself short. Apply your minds, study hard, do whatever God is calling you, but God will help you to multiply your talents in a profound way, and God will use those talents to advance his work. The purpose of the talents is not just to gain fame or reputation or wealth for our own self-aggrandizement. It is for the purpose of advancing God's work. It's been our privilege as we've traveled around the world to meet some wonderful, dedicated Seventh-day Adventists. One of them is a brother in Brazil. And I have had the privilege of work, discussing a number of times, meeting with Dr. Milton Afonso a number of times. Now, some of you may recognize his name. He's a philanthropist within the Adventist Church. Very quickly, let me tell you his story. And young people, catch the gist of this story. Catch the lesson of this story because it's profound. Milton never knew his father. His mother was extremely poor. I mean, he's described for me the poverty-stricken circumstances that he grew up in, and they are horrible. When he was five years old, his mother was so poor that she would get a little bit of flour and coconut and sugar and make little cookies, little rolls. And the way they supported themselves was that she would send her little five-year-old boy out onto the streets with a tray full of these little coconut cookies to sell in order to make some money. Five years old? That's what he was. And that's how she supported herself. She attended an evangelistic series by the Adventist pastor. She knew nothing about our message. Her life was transformed. Milton started attending the church school. His life was transformed. God blessed them in a, in a special way. He worked his way through all of the elementary school, through the secondary school, and he wanted to go on to become a lawyer. Now, somebody who has a doctor, becomes a lawyer in Brazil, is called a doctor. That's where he got his doctorate degree. Anyways, he started to sell books. That was back in the days when they had a lot of literature evangelism. Still very strong in many, many parts of the world. And in two years, this 17-year-old boy became the number one salesman of books across all of Brazil. He had a gift for selling and for promotion, for marketing, a natural gift for marketing and promotion. And then, as a young man attending university, getting his law degree, he was asked to sit on the board of our uh, Rio de Janeiro Adventist Hospital, which was having a terrible financial struggle. They had a poor patient census, and it was down, and the place was running in the red. And so Milton got the idea that he should start with the hospital a health insurance company for the hospital. And in one year, the hospital was in the black, and it was prospering. And he said, wow, I need to, I've got a, an ability in business. So he started a publishing company on his own. He was publishing and printing. He was doing well financially there. And then he got into a health insurance business. He started Golden Cross Health Insurance in South America, in Brazil. And to go quickly through the story, it grew to be the number one health insurance business in all of the country of Brazil, had more than 22,000 employees, 
when you've got a hospital where you're providing, no, when you've got a health insurance scheme and you've got to take care of people who get sick, what do you need? You need hospitals. So he started buying hospitals. If you've got hospitals, you need staff. You need doctors, all the medical technicians, etc. Well, then he bought, a, bought universities and he started training his own staff to work in his own hospitals. And then other business came along with that. Dr. Milton is today more than a billionaire in U.S. dollars. He's one of the wealthiest people in the country of Brazil. And he has used his influence and his wealth in a phenomenal way to advance God's work. Hope Channel in South America, Hope Channel in Brazil, Hope Channel for uh, Angola, Mozambique, has profited tremendously by the, by the philanthropy of Dr. Afonso. But notice, catch this young people, he was a poverty-stricken kid, five years of age, trying to get enough money by selling little cookies on the street. His ability was in marketing. His ability was in promotion and sales and all of those things. And he used that ability to build businesses to advance God's work. What do you say? Friend, God has given you talents and abilities that you might not think, oh, I can't do anything. I don't have an education. I am just a victim of my circumstances and my heredity and blah, 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 blah. God says, no, don't be a victim. Don't be a victim. Use what you've got and multiply that in a special way. Why, my friends, do we have schools like the Glendale schools? Why do we have Loma Linda University and all of our educational system around the world? Why do we do that? Because as a church, we're committed to the self-development of individuals. God has given you talents and abilities. Use them. Go beyond just the ed formal education, but expand and develop those for the purpose of advancing his work, friend. That's why we have these educational institutions in so many different ways. God wants us to develop and expand and be people of influence. Amen. But going on, the last parable. The judgment scene. I got to really move. Oh, oh, I see I'm about seven minutes over time. Oh, dear. How many of you want me to sit down and be quiet? I believe in democracy. How many honest people are there here this morning? <laughs> they sit down. <laughs> well, oh, I see one hand up there. Sorry, son. <laughs> okay, we're going to wrap it up real quick. <laughs> okay, the last, the last parable. Jesus here pictures the, the last judgment, dividing the sheep and the goats. Okay? And what's, what, about the, what about the sheep? Well, he says here, all nations, verse... 32, all nations are gathered before him. And he says, verse 35, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. I was a stranger. I was a refugee. I was a refugee, and you took me in didn't have enough clothes, I didn't have a car, I was sick, and you came. Notice, friend, Jesus sees himself, he pictures himself in the person of the underprivileged, of the disadvantaged. Jesus said, when you serve the disadvantaged, you are serving who? Me. And what, what do they say? Lord, when did we see you hungry and, and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? The, in other words, they are not even conscious that they were doing it. It was, it was just something that was spontaneous in them. And what is Jesus saying here? He is saying his people at the end of time are to be a compassionate people. Compassionate people. Compassion in many different ways. Yes, he lists some of those things. But my friends, it might be an English second language school or something else that needs to do to provide for the needs of individuals. Friends, why do we have this hospital next door? Why do we have clinics around the world? Why? We have three sons. Our oldest son is a medical doctor, graduate of Loma Linda, serving now in Nepal. 
as uh, to the Shear Memorial Hospital. Our youngest son is also a medical doctor, graduate of Loma Linda, doing a general surgery residency at uh, in Grand Rapids. Our third son, he's selling for Tesla, but the... <laughs> <laughs> my, my, why, why have we, in our own personal life, encouraged our kids to go into mission service and to do that? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not talking economic differences here. That's not my point. My point is, friends, brothers and sisters, that we are called to be a compassionate people. And spontaneously, when we encounter people, wherever they are, whatever circumstances we're in, we're thinking, how can I help them? How can I help them? We are not to be selfish just simply for the purpose of accumulating wealth, prestige, influence, for the purpose of making our own names great. We are to call to be witnesses for Jesus Christ and to be compassionate. And the church today around the world is endorsing and doing everything it can to reach out in the best way possible. But it takes individuals who are compassionate individuals. How are you a compassionate person? In closing, let me share a story. It happened many years ago, and uh, I was, uh, and this happened actually, a, a young couple, excuse me here, a young couple were in Europe, and it was a difficult time. There was economic problems and all those things, and they decided that they wanted to get married but they didn't have a future in the country that they lived. So the young man said, I'll immigrate to Canada. I'll immigrate and get a job, earn some money, and, you know, pay for you to come over. So this is what he said to his wife. And so, sure enough, after a couple of years, she got on a boat, traveled over to Canada, and they met and were married in the city of Winnipeg, and then traveled to Western Canada, where he had a home and a job. Well, um, she noticed when she met him that he was a little bit different than what she remembered. Well, she thought, oh, that's no big deal. You know, two, three years have elapsed. Everybody changes. No problem. But it turned out that the difference was actually medically based. And to make a long story short, it was discovered that he had a cancer at the base of his brain. The cancer was growing, he had disorientation, he was losing coordination, he couldn't hold a job. And this was just at the time of the beginning of World War I. And into their home, into their family, in 1915, the year that World War I began, a little boy was born. And this young lady, who was a very short little lady, discovered that she was the wife of a man who was dying, who was very sick, who had an incredible amount of pain. And because of the war, there was no way of transferring monies from the Europe to Canada. She had no savings. He had no job. They were living in a little ramshackle house and she had a little tiny baby. What was she going to do? She was desperate. Next door, there was an older couple by the family name of McGee. And Grandma McGee was a Seventh-day Adventist. Her husband wasn't, but she was. And she saw the need of this young couple. And so, veggies from the ch garden, eggs from the chickens, milk from the cow, and babysitting, she helped this young couple in their desperate need. The young man's medical condition got worse and worse. And in that day when medical science was very primitive by today's standard particularly, the doctor said, there's no hope for us to relieve your pain. Your case is terminal, but to relieve your pain, we can cut the top of your skull out and allow the brain to push up and out of the skull. Horrible solution. The nearest hospital that could do a surgery like that was hundreds of miles away. And she had this young baby. How was she going to get her husband there, take care of the baby, blah, 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 all those things. Guess who stepped in? Grandma McGee babysat the baby. And Grandma McGee 
had a friend who happened to be a pastor, president of the church in British Columbia, who lived near the hospital. So the young lady could stay with the family, the conference president, the pastor's family, and her husband went to the hospital, had the operation, and of course it took a long time to recuperate, lack of medications and stuff. And then every day, every day, when he became, you know, clear in thinking, the president gave a Bible study to the young lady, who then came and gave a Bible study to her husband as he was able to comprehend it. And when he got out of hospital, a number of weeks later, both of them were baptized as members of the Seventh Adventist Church. She went back home. Guess who took care of baby? Guess who helped with the veggies, the eggs, the milk, the cheese, etc. This is now World War I. We're now pushing 1920. Well, it was Grandma McGee. The young man passed away, died, very painful death. And here was this young lady, destitute, destitute. Guess who helped? Grandma McGee. And the young lady bought a few couple goats, started milking and selling the milk. Then a cow, milk, sold the milk. Gradually she got on her feet economically and began to be able to financially survive on her own. Guess who took care of baby during that time? Grandma McGee. The young baby was my father. And it was Grandma McGee who, through her compassion, introduced the Adventist message to the Thorpe family. My father grew up. He had a tough time in his teen years, lived a life that was not a Christian life. But when he was 22, 23, he and my mother, who he introduced to the Adventist message, were baptized, and they became leaders in the churches in the central Okanagan and in British Columbia. And God used them in a special way. I am a product of the witnessing of Grandma McGee, friends. And one of the first people that I want to meet when I get up to heaven is an old lady that I've never met. Her name is, what? <laughs> Grandma McGee. Friends, compassion will go, f it is doctrine that mo that convinces the mind, but it is compassion that wins the heart. It's compassion that wins the heart. And we need to be people of compassion. People who love like Jesus loved. And as we look at these four pictures that Jesus verbally painted, he's giving a composite picture of what you and I individually, what we as a church need to keep as a priority. Witnessing, sharing Jesus, personal spirituality, developing every skill for the advancement of God's work, and fourthly, being people of compassion. May God help us, by his grace, to be those kind of people. What do you say this morning, friend? Our closing hymn is hymn number 316, Live Out Your Life Within Me, O Jesus, King of Kings. I invite you to sing this. And yes, it's a closing song, but more than that, it's a prayer. Lord, live out your life within me. Jesus, be my King of Kings. Let's stand and sing and pray this hymn together. Hymn number 316.